about. Tomorrow morning at 9.30, I'm taking a lecture at the biotech on applications in biotechnology and nanotechnology. For the biotechnology applications, it has to do with something that I've already told you about diagnosis, about uh, gene transfer, but some other things also, and the nanotechnology, that will be also some other Especially material science. Dang, science. Dang, so, I really think it's okay. hard today, in order not to be too long. Okay? So, um, <coughs> I indicated that uh, a step beyond the uh, molecular recognition processes understand them is to try to use molecular recognition for controlling the way in which things get together. In other words, for performing what you may call sexual organization. Uh, what I have told you up to now is tailor-making objects. In other words, making a lock for a given key making, designing, pre-organizing a receptor for the selective binding of a given substrate. The next step in complexity would be to try to use these recognition processes to induce the formation of a given structure. In other words, to lead to the specific generation of a given architecture hopefully a functional architecture on the basis of the way in which you have constructed your system so that it just will spontaneously go there. And that is a, a process which you may call a self-organization. Let me just illustrate that by a biological example because that gives you a good idea about what I mean. This biological example is the assembly of a virus the tobacco mosaic virus. This virus is represented here. This is a cross section. The virus is composed of proteins, which you see here. These are the proteins of the virus, this unit here, shown here in more detailed form. And this is a schematic representation. 2,250 of these bricks spontaneously assemble, make a helix which grows, grows further and further until it generates a helical tower. And in the center of the tower, in the hole in the center, is located the genome of the virus. So that's a very interesting process because you, all you need to have is the genome, the brick, you mix it and you automatically generate the virus. What does it imply? One, you must have a specific way for getting the bricks together. That means recognition, surface, surface, recognition. Then the system grows, assembling around the genome, around the RNA. And when the RNA is completely surrounded, it stops. So you have really something. It stops because see, this, this hair touches this, and so it touches, and it doesn't touch anymore, and it stops growing. So that means that this system is self-organizing, and it functions like what you may call a programmed system. Because the molecular information for inducing the formation of this entity is contained in the components. The information is in the components, in the bricks. The bricks have to recognize each other surface to surface. In the form of the in the of the set complementary, you say, set complementary fashion. And the operation, the processing of the information is supramolecular. It happens through the type of interactions you're using. 
if you want to push the analogy with a program, you can even say that there's an algorithm for reading the information, which is the type of pattern you use, the way in which maybe three, two points of interaction and so on. This is the algorithm for reading the information. Now these are general principles. I can then try to apply them to different types of entities. And I will just show you an example which maybe of interest. I will respect to one example. There's another one which I think we do small for the I give only one example of that uh, because I want to leave the other one for the nanotechnology tomorrow. So one one way in which one can look at it is the following. Let's try to generate a given structure on the basis of the way in which the objects are constructed. And the example I want to give is the formation of a double helix. We have just shown that you can from the components of the virus, make a helical tower, which will surround the end of the middle and have all the features of a program system. Can we make double helices? You know the DNA, the double helix. The DNA of that double helix rests on the formation of a double strand through a strand, two complementary nucleoside strands. Can we make double helices which have nothing to do with natural double helices, but which will nevertheless be double helices? This can be done in the following fashion. Where one replaces the nucleotide in a polynucleotide strand by this unit, which is called a bipyridine. This bipyridine, one, two, three of them are linked together in a chain and in that respect, then generate, as you can see, a strand containing nucleotide, containing bipyridines. Now, since you have used bipyridines, <coughs> the result of that is that you will have to use something else than hydrogen bonds. Let me just go back to the nucleic acids. You know that nucleic acids contain nucleotides, which are shown here. This is adenine, guanine, uracil, and cytosine down there. And if you have two complementary strands, they wrap around each other, as shown here, where the strand wraps around this one, wraps around the other one, and generate this nucleic acid. And this is the result of hydrogen bonding between adenine and thymine, or uracil and cyto sorry, or guanine and cytosine here. So now we replace the nucleic acid strands by these bipyridine strands. <coughs> and this leads to the formation of an architecture on the basis of using now the binding of a metal ion, copper ion, binding to the bipyridines to generate double helix. How does this happen? Let me just illustrate that and explain what happens there. A bipyridine has two nitrogens, this one, and this one, this and this, this and this. Copper one, copper, is an ion which has tetrahedral coordination. In other words, it wants to bind in a tetrahedral fashion. One, two, three, four, this way. Okay. That's a tetrahedral. Okay. So, if copper 1 interacts with a bipyridine, 
it will put this and this perpendicular. Because you know that the tetrahedron is two times two points in two perpendicular planes, like that. Now, if this is the case, and if you now attach silver bipyridines in a strand, they will wrap around each other, because it's each time this. And the result is to be the formation of this double helix. So this is a self-organization process which uses the tetrahedral coordination of copper bond with pyridines to induce the spontaneous formation of a double helix. You don't have anything else to do just to mix. You get it. We obtain specific organization and we can extend it further. We call these things helicates. Huh? We call these helicates. This is a dihelicate from here with two centers. Trihelicate with three centers. Tetrahelicate with four centers. Or pentahelicate with five centers. That means this thing here is one, two, three, four. For this, one, two, three, four, five forms then the tetrahelicate and the pentahelicate. And this happens automatically. You just mix it and you get this double helices. That's one example of self organization of a helical entity in this case. You can also use other metal ions. Metal ions which contain. which have a hexa coordination, octahedral coordination geometry. What is an octahedron? An octahedron has, of course, six points of interaction. Six interactions. So if you use bipyridines, you need three of them, not two, because you have six points of interaction. And so out of that, we make a triple helix. And indeed, when you use this strand here, these strands, you treat this with nickel, iron, cobalt, or zinc also, you get automatically triple helix as shown here. Again, a spontaneous process of assembling three strands into a helical fashion and generating these entities. To indicate that indeed, that is what happens. Here we have the crystal structures. This is the double helicate, which I just showed. And this is the triple helicate. Here are the triple helix, which we got by that. What does this mean? That we can use metal ion coordination, and this is now using coordination chemistry as part of. Uh, self-organization processes, and it points out that indeed it is quite efficient to use coordination of metal ions. That is why I like to stress that hydrogen bonds, of course, are important, as we have already seen. Charge type interactions are important. These are all interactions between of non-covalent nature between entities, but metal ions are very interesting components for inducing self-organization because they have a range of coordination. A metal ion is a very rich constructing unit, construction unit. It has many coordination geometries, tetrahedral, octahedral, square planar, linear, even cubic in some cases. It has a very wide range of binding strengths. A metal ion can interact very strongly or very weakly. It has a large range of binding strengths. For instance, when sodium interacts with water, or with uh, an oxygen, an alcohol, or ether, that's rather weak. Something like less than 10 kilocalories, maybe 5, 6. When ruthenium ion interacts with pyridine, that's very strong. 
have something like 50 or 60 kilobar range per bond. You have an enormous range of binary strength. And in addition, they also have a variety of interesting properties. Coordination compounds have interesting electrochemical features, electronic properties, interesting photochemical features, one can excite them to excited state chemistry, electron transfer, ionic energy transfer, and there are also signs for reactions. So using metal ion in this design of system that are able to interact and to assemble spontaneously leads to a general area which has now been developed in many instances. I have shown you double helices. One can make cylinders, one can make grids and other type of architectures. I showed you just the architecture but I will not detail it because that's more nanotechnology I'm talking about tomorrow. But this is a general area which is quite interesting of using midline coordination to generate function what one calls metallo supramolecular type of architectures. Double helices is one example. The other example which I can just indicate without going into detail today are the architectures which are shown here and where one can make either what we call a rack which is a rigid molecule with other ones stuck linked to it through a coordination of middle ion. This is a rigid molecule, that's a rigid molecule. These are molecules just stuck to it and bound by these middle ions here. We can make ladders where two rigid molecules are bridged by others. Or you can make more complicated <coughs> these grids here where molecules are held perpendicular to one another. And where at each intersection the midline holds it together. I give you just one example of it to illustrate that. So these grids are especially interesting for potential applications. Let me just give you one example. If you take schematically a molecule which has three binding subunits, which can now coordinate midlines, if you want to fill all the coordination sites, the simplest, let's say the, the smallest system you can make with all binding sites filled, coordinated, is the three by three. Necessarily. So this is what the system we gave, because one principle is full coordination. Full coordination is the most stable state in free energy. And secondly, it's the smallest entity with the entropy is highest. So that's what the system will do. The thermodynamics pushes the system towards the generation of this grid. And indeed, If you use this molecule here, which has one, two, three binding sites, and treat it with silver one, silver, which is also a tetrahedral coordination, just mix it together. You make one molecule, you add the silver, you let it go. And you get this entity, which has nine silvers nicely located in an array of three by three. This is the crystal structure. It shows that indeed the molecule is what we expect, the architecture. We see here nine silvers linked together and holding the molecule in a grid like array. Now, the self organization processes are interesting not only for the generation of uh, 
what you may call nanostructures. This kind of structure I've shown to you are nanostructures. But they're also interesting for the generation of new materials. Now, material science is something which is uh, usually assigned in organic chemistry, like polymer chemistry, polymer science, or inorganic chemistry, like uh, solid state type of uh, inorganic entities, like zeolites, or like uh, other type of surface arrays. And let me give you an example of uh, materials which use the self-organization of supermolecular entities to generate new material. So let's have a look at what one can do on going from molecular materials to supermolecular materials. The question which one can ask is what type of materials are interesting? And I want to illustrate this by one example, which is what we call dynamos, polymers, which are reversible. Dynamic polymers. Why dynamic? Because supramolecular interactions, non-covalent interactions, are rather weak. So they can dissociate and reassociate. So if you make a material out of components linked by non-covalent interactions, this will be rather labile for back to components and reassociate. Now this may be a problem because you usually want a metal which is stable. But on the other hand, it is an advantage also because it has different new properties, which is the fact that when it can dissociate and reassemble, it means that it has also the possibility to adapt and change when the conditions change. In other words, these are dynamic materials. So supramolecular polymers are what you might call dynamic materials of supramolecular nature because the components of the material are linked by non-covalent bonding. Let me show you an example of that. Supramolecular polymer chemistry has developed in recent years, in the last 10 years or so, and has generated a new area of polymer chemistry, which is uh, still sort of in the starting phase. It took some time to convince polymer chemists that linking things by non covalent bond is interesting also. Usual polymer chemistry, as you know, is to take a component, a monomer, and connect monomers together by an ionic polymerization cationic polymerization or radical polymerization making covalent bonds. What we now would like to investigate is can one make polyassociation entities where the monomers are linked together by non-covalent bonds. In other words, polyassociation of complementary monomers which are connected through non-covalent type of interactions. <coughs> This can then be represented in this way, where the building blocks are monomers containing recognition groups here and here. As you see, this recognition group is complementary to this one, and so you may think that they will interact and then generate a chain. You can also think of using trivalent groups, then you can do cross-linking, like polymer chemists do it in covalent chemistry, or you can use single monotopic groups, which then would be end capping, compounds for end capping. I cannot go into all of the illustrations, but I just want to show you an example. The simplest is linear polymerization, where this monomer is two binding sites, this monomer is two binding sites, this is complementary to that. They will attach and generate by fully association this type of chain. If you add a group which is trivalent, then you get cross-linking as shown here. 
and of course you can also do an cutting if you want. So let's have a look at one of them. That's one case, the first one we have studied. For example, in 1990, the group at the Collège de France in Paris, where you see the following. Here we have used a unit which is simply, okay, simply, it's a very complicated unit, but uracil, one of the nuclear bases. Okay? This uracil has an electron except a uh, hydrogen bond acceptor, hydrogen bond donor, hydrogen bond acceptor side. A acceptor, D donor, A acceptor. The complementary unit to that in terms of recognition is of course D A D. Donor, acceptor, donor. Yeah? So acceptor, donor, acceptor is complementary to donor, acceptor, donor. So you expect that if you mix this with that, you will establish three hydrogen bonds between these two units. Now you start with this compound where two groups are linked to a spacer, and here two groups are linked through the same or another spacer here, then you should expect to obtain a poly associated chain where you have a very long chain forming as a result of these poly association processes. In this case, we use as a spacer in the middle tartaric acid. Tartaric acid is a nice compound, it's naturally available. You find it in wine, as I have a lot in France. There's also wine coming in my hand now, I understand. And uh, so this tartaric acid is chiral. And you know Pasteur has worked on tartaric acid. And if you are at the university with Pasteur, you must use tartaric acid at least once in your life. Not rather a good scientist now. So uh, tartaric acid has asymmetric centers, has two alcohols, two acids. So you can attach this group to the ester functions. You can attach to the OHs a long chain, C12, H25, to make it more soluble and hemophilic. <coughs> and then the following thing happens, which is rather interesting. This alone is a solid compound with a melting point. This alone is also a solid compound with a melting point. When you mix them together, you get now a new compound, which is a liquid crystal, and which can then be analyzed. And I will show you what it is. By doing X-ray diffraction experiments, <coughs> one finds that the compound obtained is a triple helix. Triple helix where three of those strands are wrapped around the helix, uh, around the axis. Huh? Three strands are wrapped around. They are shown here. One. Two, three. I use different shaping. This, this, and that. That's one strand. The second one, and the third one. Here, I only represented one to show you how things go. And here, all three are shown. The distance between these here is 12.5 angstroms. Between one and the next strand, 3.4. That's exactly the contact between aromatic fat molecules. The diameter of the cylinder is about 15 about 15 angstroms, and the, whole, the diameter of the whole thing is about 38 from here to here. These are the long chains C12 H25. Now this looks very specific, but at the same time it's very important to give a very precise description of what is going on. If you want to have an idea about what happens here, that's about to be used. <laughs> But it is, uh, it's not completely correct, because this is double helix. <laughs> and these things sticking out are these chains. But it is quite correct, because as you know, when you have these bottle cleaners, that's a bottle cleaner. If 
you take two of them, they can stick together and just put them together, they stick. That's exactly what happens. This cylinder with three helices has a lot of hair sticking out, these chains here. And the result is that you get very long fibers. And you can see these fibers by electron microscopy. I show you the fibers here. You get very nice long fibers which result from, as you can see here, let's see, let me just show you. See, this is the, one of those fibers. The diameter of this is about 50 angstroms, what you expect from what I showed earlier. Then they stick together, so they stick together here, they continue, and here also, you have these sticking together, you have these sticking together. These things are very long, these are microns, long. very long fibers. Furthermore, tartaric acid is chiral, as an acid has two asymmetric centers. So you have l tartaric acid. If you use l tartaric acid, you get fibers which are hemispherical and right-handed. It's done this way, right-handed, this way. If you use d tartaric acid, the fibers are left-handed, they're done this way. If you use meso tartaric acid, which has no chirality, you have no, no helices, you have just fibers of helices. But that is quite nice also because you can see that the molecular asymmetry is translated into a supramolecular helicity. Furthermore, the properties of such compounds are quite interesting because they have quite different properties from normal polymers. Normal polymers have for instance, features like viscosity, which depend on chain motions, polymer chains. In this case, when you heat it up, you break the hydrogen bonds, so the viscosity drops very quickly. So in terms of mechanical properties, of course, polymer chemists say, sure, the compact may be interesting, but mechanically, that was very strong. That's true. But they have other properties. In other words, Supramolecular polymers are not going to replace normal polymers, but they bring normal properties, like, for instance, very rapid change in viscosity. It's like switching viscosity. You begin to heat a little, viscosity drops. Or you begin to shear, you induce mechanical stre stress on the substance, you cleave also the bonds, and you lose the viscosity, the viscosity, and it comes back. I can show you that in a case which I don't want to go more detail, just to show you what happens. In a case where, I'll just show you that, which is here, that's another type of uh, supramolecular polymer formed by two units, which are also complementary, I don't want to go too much into details, this comes into that, and you see that the viscosity it's very high at low shear rate, and as soon as you put mechanical stress, this what it drops. When you stop stressing mechanically, the viscosity comes back. That could be interesting, for instance, that's an example. If you have, uh, um, if you want to use it as a lubricant, as soon as you turn, the viscosity goes, and things uh, work very easily, turns very easily, and that's when you push. So we have drawings from breaking and the viscosity comes back. So these are self-assembling systems which need lead to new materials. What are the characteristics of these materials? Things I do not want to go too much into details, but indicate to you what are the conceptual features of these entities. Supermolecular material has several interesting properties. First of all, it is an instructive material. What I mean by that is that in this polymer you have seen, only complementary groups <coughs> will bind together. So if you make a mixture of many compounds, only the ones which are complementary will connect, not the others. That means it's a sort of a self-assembly which selects in the mixture the complements, and only the complements. 
then they are dynamic. I mean by that that they can break and reform, which means also they can exchange their components. That's a very important feature. For instance, if you want to modify the property of your program, you can add another component with suitable recognition rules, which will automatically enter into the point of chain, and therefore have a point of which is responsive to changes in the environment, for instance. They are combinatorial, <coughs> meaning again that if you have a different type of monomers, which all have similar recognition groups. They may recombine and just give mixtures of chains with properties which depend on factors like the temperature, the pH, or the nature of the medium, includes non -inclus, uh, polar, non-polar, and so on. This is why I may call supermicrobial polymers as one illustration of what can be a dynamic combinatorial material which introduces, on the basis of supermolecular chemistry, a rather important concept, I think, for future perspectives, or perspectives for future development. Let me just show that in the following way. What we have done, what I have indicated and illustrated up to now, is the generation of self-assembling systems on the basis of a design. We have designed the system, we have tried to understand how it can assemble, and then we have tried the experiment, and as a result, we have obtained a given assembling process. Now, is this the way in which, the only way in which one can do things? So, design the center. Next thing which would be interesting, can we also do self-organization by selection? In other words, we make a system where the self-organization process selects automatically what it needs to form. And I want to illustrate that to you because it gives ideas about developments in this area. Remember, I have told you that this compound, this compound, this one, this one, this one, and this one, they assemble to give helicates. Then we did something which is terrible. Usually, an organic chemist spends his or her time cleaning up compounds, making pure compounds. Okay? That's what we should do. But you can ask the question, what happens if you have mixtures? Now, I do not say that you have to make dirty compounds for that. You don't want to do that because your research advisor will be very unhappy with that. <laughs> but you may ask yourself, if you make a mixture of compounds, you know the structure, what will happen? So we took these four and mixed them together. We know that individually they form double helices. What do they do when they are mixed? There are two possibilities, extreme possibilities. One possibility is they will give all possible combinations. The other one is they will only form the correct pairing with the right substance which is correctly there. That would be quite interesting. And indeed, we do it. We get only the correct pairing. Which means that in the mixture, the compounds select themselves so as to get only the correct indicates. This is one. Let's make it a little bit more complicated. I had shown earlier that we can make a double helix with this strand and copper one, a triple helix with this strand and nickel two. Now we mix together the two strands, we mix together copper and nickel, just run the whole thing. 
what comes out is <laughs> oh, so <laughs> and what comes out is the correct bearing. In other words, you get the double helix with the correct strength and one one, and the triple helix with the correct strength and equal two. Which means the self-assembling system selects what it needs. It means also for thermodynamics that a thermodynamically most stable state is a state where the double helix forms with the correct strand and over one, the triple helix forms with the other correct strand and nickel two. So this is, so to say, normal in terms of thermodynamics, but it represents nevertheless something very interesting because it indicates that if your programming of the system is well done, then the system is self-sorting. It knows what to do, so to say. It has the necessary molecular recognition information to generate the correct compounds, irrelevant of the fact that it's pure or mixed. In other words, it's robust. When the instructions are robust enough, they function, even if it's a mixture. I like to call that an instructed mixture, meaning by that the following, that we should, of course, know the structure of our molecules, the purity of the molecules, and know how to make it your compounds. But once we know these features, we should also know how to control what a complicated mixture of many things will do. Now, the example I gave here were rather simple, but at the start of something which I may call self organization by selection, where the system selects automatically what, because it's dynamic and can search out every possibility. So, you know, when you mix all these things together, many things happen. Uh, when you follow the, what happens in the mixture, you, get, you see many things at the beginning. Then, progressively, the system cleans itself and give on it the right compound at the end. This is what you may call a mixture of intact components. Where the important thing is not that the compounds are pure, but they are instructed. I really think that uh, in the development of organic chemistry and of uh, bioorganic chemistry and of inorganic chemistry, by using molecular recognition processes to direct the evolution of a complicated mixture is a very important process to understand and to control better. And let me convince you by just giving one example, again a biological example. A living cell, cell is a mixture of many, many, many compounds. As you know, a cell is a very complicated thing with many different molecules. But it lives. What does it mean? That each molecule knows what to do and does what it has to do at the right moment, at the right rate, in the right position in the cell, with transport in and out of the cell. So, I think biology shows us that what is important is to make molecular systems where the instructions are good enough, robust enough, so they can function in a complicated mixture where each component knows what to do. Of course, they are not fully stable. You know that if you take a cell, you put some sulfuric acid on it, it's killed. These compounds are sure you to put sulfuric acid, they are killed also. But it means that in a given range of conditions, for a living cell, it's obviously not too hot, not too acid, not too basic, water present, and hydrophilic, and so on. And then it lives. If you change too much the pH, you heat it up, you kill it. The systems I have shown you, the same happens. If you, as I said, if you add some acid, you destroy the helices. If you heat them up, you destroy the helices. Uh, but the important thing is to realize that we can think of using what one has learned about molecular recognition to direct the evolution of a chemical system into a certain direction, to lead it into a certain direction, and as a consequence, then be able to control a complicated system by designing properly the components and then they will assemble even in complicated conditions. Now, I indicated 
that they are double helices, they are triple helices, and the study of another type led to a new field which is related to what I just said about self-organization by selection. Let me just show you that as a conclusion and open in some perspectives. One can induce the formation of circle helices as you know, in nature also, plasmids are circular DNA, circular double helices. So one question we asked ourselves, can we also make double helices which are circular? This was just an academic question, so it's just nice to be able to do it. We have made double helices, we have made triple helices, can we make circular helices? And indeed, when you take this substance with iron, you get a substance which we didn't predict really exactly, but we get one where strands, these strands are forming a circular double helix with five iron centers. How does that happen? It happens in the following way. You see, each iron is bound to the terminal pyridine of two strands and to the central pyridine of the third strand. As a result of that, you have what you may call dangling ends, and you have the possibility to connect these centers around the circle, making this entity with iron, 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 five of them, and each center is octahedral, and it forms, you see this helical, this is helical here, this helical is wrapped around, and they form what you may call a circular double helical. In addition, something interesting was happening. When we looked at the substance, we found that there was a chloride ion in the middle. This. Okay, why? First thing is, of course, to show that the structure is correct. The crystal structure showed that indeed it is correct. It's a nice structure. It looks like a flower, somewhat. Which has one, two, three, four, five irons. It has five strands, the white one, the red one, the green one, the yellow one, the blue one. So this is nice. And in the middle you have the chloride ion. <coughs> so this seems fine. And you can stop there. You can say, okay, we have a nice substance, we have a certain double helicate, then we're happy with it. But very often it happens in science that an experiment wants to tell you more than what you really want to do initially. And then you should, I think it's a general thing one should do when you have a result of an experiment, you should always think about what this experiment can tell you more than what you expected. In this case, the question was, why do we get a pentagon, five? Because after all, if you look at the components of the system, if you look at the components, this is the brick, this is the iron, is the cement. There's no reason we could get five, four, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. There's no reason why we get five in principle. So, why do we get five? Of course, one could say, oh, we get five, maybe it's because of the chloride because the chloride is bound very, very strongly in the middle. It is surrounded by 10 positive charges, 5 times 2, 5 irons. So it's a very strong electrostatic potential. The chloride fits exactly into the hole. And maybe it's the chloride that determines that we get a pentagon. Of course, then we can do something simple. We do the same with iron sulfate or iron chloroborane right away. And you see what happens. If you look at it, and what do you see? You get a hexagon. With tetrafluoroborate or with sulfate. That's something interesting. 
If you add chloride to this, you go back to the pentagon. And you should precipitate the chloride with silver nitrate, for instance, to achieve the chloride, you go back to the hexagon. So that's a kind of system which is dynamic and which adjusts to the presence or the absence of chloride. What does it mean? It means something very general, that a dynamic system can adjust, can recombine itself, and adjust to the conditions of the environment. I can express it in the way shown here. That starting with this strand, treating it with <coughs> metalline, zinc, or iron, cobalt, one can get a square, pentagon, hexagon, anything in principle. What you get in reality is in fact depending on the presence of something else. If chloride is present, you get the pentagon. With sulfate or with tetrachloride, you get the hexagon, which is weakly bound. If you get, if you take bromide, that's somewhat too big, you get a mixture of six of five and six. You get a mixture of pentagon and hexagon. So this possibility to have systems which adapt to the thermodynamics of the whole system was something which seemed very interesting for the development of what we then called dynamic combinatorial chemistry, which I do not want to detail more today, but Thor, who sits here, worked on it, which is really good. I will see more about tomorrow when I'm in the biotech because it's more biotech type, but let me just give you an example for those who may not be around tomorrow to, uh, to show you what it leads to. I just want to illustrate that. I told you earlier about the log and the key of Emil Fischer. Okay? What is the principle? You have a lock and you want a key for the lock. And drug company, to give an example, when you make a new pharmaceutical compound, drug companies have approached the problem in the following fashion. This I will use again tomorrow, but I want to illustrate it quickly today. Just to show how this leads. If you have a biological target, you want to make a biologically active compound. One of the most successful methods have to be trial and error. We don't know if so we try. But most of the compounds, the drugs we are taking, are this type, and then usually natural products. People try 2,000, 10,000 compounds, and some act. And then they develop interesting substances, very, very good ones. Penicillin, Taxotere, a uh, lot of compounds, aspirin, all these are natural compounds which have a biological action, which were discovered by chance. Not very satisfying, but it works. Okay. And the second is very satisfying intellectual rational design. What do you do? You isolate your receptor, you do the crystal structure if you can, look at the crystal structure, look at the cavity, the binding sites, you design a molecule which will fit exactly into the binding site, and then you hopefully get an active compound because it will bind to the natural receptor and inhibit it or act or um, amplify its action and so on. So that is satisfying for molecular recognition. If you understand molecular recognition, that's what you hope to be able to do. And comes this approach which is called combinatorial chemistry. What we do there? In combinatorial chemistry, people say, look, you guys have tried to understand molecular recognition. Well, that's nice. But we don't need that. What we will do, we will make a million compounds of all possible structures. We will try a million compounds, and maybe one of them will be active. 
even if we do not know at the beginning, if we cover it well enough all the possible that's very different from structures, we might get something active. And drug companies are very much engaged in combinatorial synthesis, making many, 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 many molecules and trying all of them. The approach we have been taking in my group is to say, yeah, uh, okay, first of all, it's not very nice to rely on chance. Intellectually, it's not so but that is not funny, huh? If you just try and hope to get something. The approach was to make mixtures of compounds, of components which can connect and disconnect all the time. So that they generate reversibly all possible combinations. And if one of these reversible combinations fits the habit, it will be amplified and picked out. So it's a self-sorting system, the system which, because it is dynamic, will perform self-sorting, self-choosing the best one. And uh, this can then be represented in a way which can be linked to what I said about earlier about locks and keys. The combinatorial chemistry approach would be the following. You have a lock, a biological lock. You, have not, you don't know what key you have to use. So you go to somebody who has many, many, many keys, a key maker, you ask this fellow, look, you give me a million keys, I will try all of them. If you are lucky, one of the keys will fit. The other approach is to do the following, and the one we have been pursuing. is not to make a key, but to have only pieces of key and have these pieces reversibly assembled. For instance, suppose they're magnetic, for instance, that the keys are magnetic, and then all these things can sink together. See, these are the pieces, and you can just then generate a dynamic library, which is a mixture of all possible combinations, but always in equilibrium. They always go back and forth, back and forth. And when now you add the receptor, if one of those fits, or less well, the receptor will pick it up. So you can amplify it, or if you put the receptor, for instance, on a solid state column, you can just run the mixture through, and the good one will be sticks on the column. So as a result, you will be able, in this system, to perform self-selection. The good compound will automatically select itself, because of the dynamics driving to the best binder. Now, I will not go through. we have applied that to a number of enzymes, enzyme inhibitors, and a number of other compounds. This will be something I will describe tomorrow. That you can use these reversible connections for generating a dynamic system. And this dynamic system will be able to adapt. This is an area which, in the future, I think, will very probably also develop, which consists of the following. If you have a chemical system where the components are connected in a reversible fashion, reversibility can be supramolecular, because like in supramolecular polymers I have, we have looked at, the bonding is reversible, so pieces can go in and out all the time. On the molecular level, in order to do the same, you have to introduce reversible functions. Functional groups which can condense and dissociate and reassociate and dissociate. For instance, the reaction of an amine with a carbonyl leads to an amine. And if you add water, it goes back and when you remove the water or when the reaction forms, it comes again. In other words, what I'm saying is that 
In the future, an important aspect of chemical systems which gives them the capability to adapt to receptors, to changing conditions, to changing temperature, to changing pH, to changing chloride, sulfate, whatever is present, uh, will allow the development, it will rest on the introduction of reversible bonding, not only in supramolecular systems, where the reversibility is by nature present, because supramolecular systems are reversible by nature, but you can introduce it into molecules by introducing covalent, covalent bonds which are reversible. But that is something which at the beginning was very disturbing for me, and I guess for many people, for most of us. Because usually when we make a molecule, we want it to be stable. We want the thing to hang together. And if it's not stable, you put it in the cold, you put it in the fridge, because you don't want it to decompose. But this is perfectly correct, of course. But on the other hand, you can also ask yourself the question, if we introduce on purpose reversible bonds into molecules, can we not then have new features which covalent stable molecules do not have? And obviously, one of the features is adaptive, the fact that this system can be done adaptive. So constitutionally dynamic chemistry, in other words, chemistry where the constitution of the molecule changes under the pressure of what happens outside, introduces a new dimension, which is adaptation. These constitutional dynamic systems are chemical systems which undergo, or are capable of undergoing, continuously recomposition, recombination, reorganization by under the influence of other factors. For instance, you're heated. For instance, one case you can imagine. Suppose you have a system which is uh, very, very viscous. And this system, which is very viscous, you want to make it less viscous. You add another component. If it can mix in, then the viscosity drops. We have shown that, if I can to borrow, I've shown that. Um, I think I'll show you that just because maybe if I find it, this mess here. I think I would like just to show you that. Because it's quite interesting, an illustration of what one can do. It has been done by collaborators from Mitsui Chemical Company. Here it is. It shows how dynamic systems can change their properties. I come back to that in a moment. Because I want to illustrate that to you because a number of you probably are not around tomorrow. If you take this compound, this hydrogen, and condense it with this dialdehyde. You get a polymer where these are hydrosomes, C and double bonds. Now that's not what you expect. And this is a very stretchy polymer. You can make the polymer, and this was uh, done by Takashi Udo, and you can stretch it. It's a good rubber, okay? This is nothing special, there are many rubbers around. But what is interesting is that when you now take this rubbery system, and mix into it components which are much more rigid, like this one containing uh, diphenol, and this one diadehyde, beta diadehyde, beta phallic acid diadehyde. Then you transform soft and stretchy polymer into a strong and hard polymer simply because you introduce into the chain rigid groups and then the polymer is not so flexible anymore. This only illustrates the feature, the fact that dynamic systems, where the constitution of the compound is dynamic, can change their properties as a function of what is incorporated. So if I may go back to my earlier, This type of chemistry is constitutionally dynamic. I mean by that it's not a motion 
dynamics are usually either reaction dynamics, which, you, which one learns in the chemical kinetics, chemical kinetic dynamics field, or there are motions like uh, a method group which turns or which reaction which inverts chair to chair inversion. These are motion dynamics. These are dynamics which are linked to the constitution, where the constitution of the object changes because the bonds are reversible. And as a consequence, you have now a feature of adaptation where you select given components under the pressure of these external factors. So, this is more or less the conclusion. Let me just sort of wrap it up by putting together a number of features we have been looking at today. Mm -hmm. On one hand, we said that chemical systems are, can be instructed, they contain information, and this is a program. On the other hand, we can make the system dynamic, dynamic because we can introduce reverse rebonding. And if there is reverse rebonding, then we can have constitutional diversity, different type of molecules, because they recombine all the time. These three features make possible selection of optimal components. If the components are optimal, it means an adaptation is occurring, and we have chemical systems which can adapt. The next step in the future will be, like in Darwinian type of evolution, of course, uh, a living organism is a bit more complicated than a bunch of molecules, so this is far away, but the idea of introducing a Darwinian way of thinking the molecular systems means that the next step would be to also try to systems which undergo evolution. Meaning by that, that after the first round of adaptation, you block it, you have an acquired character, which is acquired, a character which is acquired. <coughs> and on that basis, you can go another step, and another step, and another step, leading to time dependent evolution. So, we have in fact gone from understanding recognition processes. First of all, trying to ask the question of what happens between molecules. This is supermolecular world. Then, this understanding leads to the idea that molecules which have recognition processes, which define the way in which these interactions occur. This leads to programmability, information storage, information readout, uh, following given algorithms of recognition. Read up. This led them, as a next step, to the fact that on the basis of supermolecular entities, because non covalent bondings are reversible, the fact that this led to the realization that supermolecular systems are dynamic and therefore can adapt. And then importing this supermolecular feature into molecular chemistry by introduction of reversible covalent bonds in molecules makes, gives, leads to the general area of constitutional dynamic chemistry, which is either supermolecular, because supermolecular systems by nature are dynamic, or which can be molecular if you, by on purpose, introduce reversible bonds. And this time, opens the possibility to design systems which are adaptive. So that is more or less what I want to tell you today. I think in this development of uh, leading of chemical systems which are more and more complex, we progressively have the possibility through chemistry to understand the complexity of molecular systems. Biological complexity is of course highest of all in the we of all, everything around us, but biological systems are molecular systems. So they operate on the basis of molecules. Biological systems tell us how complex molecular systems can be. And we can make use of progressive
chemical investigation to understand more and more how these complex systems function. And one major approach is to also try to understand adaptation in given systems. So I think in the future, from supermolecular chemistry to dynamic constitutional chemistry, there is a possibility to develop systems which present features of adaptation and of evolution. And I think in the future, this will be interesting both basically, also for applied reasons, and not the least, for understanding the function, the function, the way biological systems function and adapt. So I wish all of you a lot of success. I hope that uh, chemistry will flourish here. And uh, I'm sure that so many people are up, so okay, good. And I look forward to come back sometime and uh, talk with you again. Thank you very much. Uh, recently, I have read a famous on uh, nanostructures. There are uh, several groups of scientists interested in uh, nanotubes uh, made from cyclic peptide linking together with hydrogen bond. Um, what is the potential applications of this nanotube? Yeah, this is, you are mentioning the Vince Gadiri did. Um, yeah, these nanotubes are interesting. Now, they, uh, it's possible that by, this, what is mentioned here is that uh, Reza Gadiri, especially in uh, Scripps Institute, uh, the West Coast in the US, he has made psychic peptides which are designed in such a fashion that they can stick on top of each other like rings that can make a tube by piling up rings. And you have a hole in the middle and this hole can of course be um, a way, a channel to lead ions through. So um, they think that uh, possibly these substances may be perhaps drugs, may be cytotoxic because if they make a membrane permeable to uh, sodium or potassium, this could be so as first of all it's an interesting type of object, nanotubes which are polypeptidic. On the other hand, whether they have applications or not, one can think that there will be interesting pharmaceutical applications, biological activities. And there are some, but whether they will be useful in terms of drugs, I don't know. This is still something, uh, they are interesting because they probably are not toxic since uh, they are peptides. So, and it shouldn't be toxic. Unless, of course, they make cells leaky to sodium or potassium and then they can be cytotoxic. On the other hand, cytotoxicity can be good if you want to destroy a given cell, but it must be selected. Uh, I'm sure that uh, all of you uh, this is one of the best, if not the very best lecture we have ever listened uh, in our lifetime. I must confess that uh, I have listened to Professor Lane's lecture many, many times. The first time was 36 years ago, you might not know. <laughs> I was a student and you were very young. <laughs> well, you came to England and uh, in the stereo chemistry symposium. Oh, yeah. Right. That was 36 years. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, <laughs> every time, you know, I'm educated. The science of his lecture is exceptionally beautiful. And, uh, you know, the reason and the thinking behind his research project is outstanding. And uh, most importantly, uh, if you notice, Professor Lane has got this exceptional ability to make very difficult science into very simple things. It's so simple that all of us thought that we could do it tomorrow. <laughs> we will never be able to do it. To travel all the way from France to uh, stimulate us. Thank you very much.
populism. And uh, I think it's very kind of you to say that, uh, okay, it's difficult to redo what I presented, but I was summarizing work of many people for a long time. And I understand sometimes it's a bit, when you hear the result of many years, you see that, okay, how has this happened? But there were a lot of mistakes made. A lot of learning processes going through. I'm sure that you are able to do excellent science and you just have confidence. And also you should be proud of being scientists in general, chemists in particular, because we are in a world where some more rational thinking bringing, not today was hardcore chemistry, that's what we wanted, lectures. But chemistry is a science. And science is for me the only universal culture. It's the only culture which is valid everywhere and which cannot be disputed. A melting point is a melting point everywhere. Water melts at zero degrees under the same pressure everywhere. So I think we have, what is a bit trivial, but I think we have the advantage. So let's see if we can be really thankful to have become for some reason on our scientists because we have a universal culture. And if we apply or try to convince our countrymen, our citizens around, to be more rational thinking, as we try to be a little bit rational, I don't know, I'm sorry, sometimes in a passionate fashion. But nevertheless, we have an approach to problems which, in view also of this general organization, this idea of this promoting peace, more rational thinking, somewhat more scientific spirit in our societies, with some help. I very much strongly encourage you to propagate this person. Thank you. So, thank you very much for everybody that stayed with us until now. Thank you very much.